what what does happen is that you start at the level you well you will see I'll talk about that in a second obviously. anyways let's get the two or three done yes 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 yeah all right but I'll explain to them later okay so let's do two eight three yes question uh-huh The top two scores on the test guarantee A's, oh. right? But then also for the class, the top two gain points, right? The top two in total points, no, not gain points, total points, also guarantee A's. So that means if Justin's had come up short from an, of an A, he could have still gotten an A because he's number one. Are you with me, I'm trying to say? So if nobody gets an A, the top two get A's. Are you with me? Yes. Yes. I like something like that. Yes, you will always get a you get a, always get a help, but for being the top five. Yes. All right. Where is it? Okay, here we go. Okay, AP Biology. Let's talk about two. I actually like two eight three a lot, and I actually like this a lot more. And I'm really passionate about evolution. By the way, those of you who have not not watched it. And like bio, you know, you actually enjoy it, or you like the idea of being a scientist, or being a doctor, or whatever. Those think about it videos someday in your life when you have the time, watch them. All right, they're in the evolutionary theory folder, but you can also uh, Google it. All right, the, the channel on YouTube. But I've downloaded the videos and put them in the evolutionary theory in a folder called uh, Videos in Dr. Torres. They're really good. They have built, they, he has both pro evolution and anti creationism videos. And the anti-creationism videos is not, I personally, it's not that you're personally, I'm against creationism. It's more about uh, defying stupid logic. Are you with me? And you learn so much from that. You learn to think. And that's really good. That's why it's called Think About It. Because it, it, it learns, it teaches you the fallacies that people usually make. Remember that little picture yesterday that I said on Sally? Those of you who saw it. So we don't come, birds don't come from velociraptors. Right? Uh, they could, but velociraptors don't have living descendants, right? So it, birds don't come from that group. They come from another group. Also, like she said, evolution is not linear. There's a, a lot of branches. That way it makes it look like one became the other, they became the other, they became the other. Are you with me? And then you have two species, which are both recent species in sequence, because there's one that's like stork looking, right? And then another one is the kiwi. So it's like saying the kiwi came from storks, and that's really off. Really bad. And then there's all the things like, even the word itself that says evolution sucks, right? Sometimes. It's like, what they're making fun of is that saying sometimes evolution is, is bad, right? Well, it doesn't suck. Like, who said it? I think it was Sasser, right? Uh, was it you that said it? You said, well, they got to survive, so it didn't suck at all. If they didn't change, they would have died, right? So that was good. They were just matching their environment at the time. Uh, but I get what they're trying to say is that, you know, you used to have an awesome Velociraptor, and now you have a, a you know, a little Kiwi, which, by the way, you know, does, does, you know didn't really make it, right? So, but, <laughs> but, you know, the, 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 but the point is, who says a Velociraptor is necessarily more awesomer than, than the other one? Right? <laughs> who, who's, who, who necessarily says that? And then, so these fallacies that people have are what we have to challenge here. And those videos are really good for that. All right, so then... Let's talk about two, three. Molecules and atoms from the environment are necessary to build other molecules. So this is kind of goes into the biochemistry chapter. Now, and I'm not going to sit here and teach you guys a carbon cycle, all right? But I will talk about something that's very important. The, the molecules of life, all right? So what are the main categories of molecules of life? Let's see if we can do some legal participation here, all right? So Kevin, give me one type of macromolecule that shows up in life. Carbohydrate. Right, so put carbs in here. All right. Give me one and this. Lipids. Actually, I'm going to do it horizontally. There's no way you're going to be able to see this from the video. Because I have to write tiny. But you can listen. Um, Sunday, give me another one. Nucleic acid. And then, what's the last one? Let's see. Sidro. Michelle. Yes? Protein. 
Protein. Now, aside from that, what is the number one molecule of life? No, the most common molecule in life forms. Yes? No, of course not. More important, yes. More important. More important. More important. It's not RNA? No. Yes. No. What did you say? Water. Water. Now, of course, these are complex macromolecules. Water is a simple molecule. But water is a very important for life. And we'll talk about water um, halfway through this, OK? Um, there's a lot, actually, that goes into this afterward. OK? So what, what you need to know about each one of them, and I'm definitely don't, not going to go slow enough for you to write this down, all right? But what I, I'm just putting the chart on the board so that you go home and fill it, fill it in yourself, all right? But for each one of them, you should know the monomers. For each one of them, you should do monomer structure. So you know the name of the monomer and its structure. For each one of them, you need to know the polymers examples. You need to know polymer structure. You need to know function. You need to know how the structure ties to the function. And last but not least, you need to know the elements that show up in that molecule. The elements that show up in that molecule, right? You need to be able to know how to populate that chart. If you can do that, you, all, you know what you need to know about biochemistry. Some other time, I'll walk you sl uh, slow, slowly through this and, and try, if I have the time, to populate that chart. Or I'll make it a quiz. But the, we can go through this very quick. Monomers of carbs are called? Monosaccharides. Give them a name. Lipids. What are lipids built up? Yes? Fatty acids and glycerol. So fatty acid chains and a glycerol. Okay? Which, now, the monosaccharides, Right? They have, um, well, let's, let's, let's do all, all the carb stuff first. Okay? So, I have to load up my lecture. But you know what? Honestly, I think that biochemistry actually shows up later. So, I'm going to do this later. Not today. But here's, here, to make my life easier, we're going to skip this today and talk about this some other day. You try to populate this. All right? At home, bring this done. I'll give you grades for it. Okay? Give you a grade for it. It's mandatory, though. It's not like a optional thing. Okay, I'll give you a grade for it. Populate this. By the way, when you are doing polymer structure, okay, so do all of them. For, so for carbs, for example, you do you do uh, the disaccharides, the famous disaccharides, you do you do uh, starch, you do uh, cellulose, you do glycogen, right? For the lipids, you do wax, you do triglycerides, phospholipids, uh, steroids, these are, th these are the polymer structures. For nucleic acids, DNA, RNA. For protein, you have to talk about primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary structure when you're talking about the polymer structure. When you're talking about how the structure fits the function, you're looking for examples of where, the, this, is, this is the one that I have to focus on teaching. The rest you can all get from the book, it's all in the book, all right? So each monomer, you need to be able to know the name, recognize how it looks like, Right? And then you know, to know examples of polymers. And I gave you for carbs and lipids and nucleic acids. Proteins, you just, you know, you do examples of proteins too. There's like, for, and what I, what I would suggest also is that for every polymer that you give an example of, you tie it to a functional. So, for example, if you're talking about triglycerides, they're primi primarily for long term energy storage, all right, and insulation, right? But waxes are more for protection. Or, um, or even building things out of, the, out of that. Okay, um, there is uh, oils, which are also happen for water, uh, water uh, resistance, right, and stuff like that. There's steroids, which are for communication, right? So for each of the polymer examples, you tell how the polymer structure looks like, you tell what the function of that thing is like, 
and you tell how the structure allows it to perform its function. For triglycerides, make sure you talk about the difference in between saturated and unsaturated. Are you with me? So that's this for the lipids. For nucleic acids, you have to talk about why does the RNA structure differ from the DNA structure and how does that tie to their function. For RNA, there's multiple types of RNA, so you should do rRNA, tRNA, and mRNA at least. Right? And for proteins, you can give examples of several types of proteins, one for each type of function you're going to talk about. So proteins are communi communication. They are cell membrane junctions. They are cell membrane gates. They are, um, they are messengers between cells called hormones also, made of pro proteins. They are, they are regulators. They are enzymes. They are structural. Mm -hmm. They build things. They make things move, right? There's a lot of functions. So for each of the functions of proteins that you find, think of a biology example of that, right? And then as far as structure goes, in general, proteins have two main kinds of structures, which is the, is the globular structure for form of many subunits put together, which, it, which is in turn made of tertiary structures put together, which are in turn made of uh, secondary structures put together, which are in turn made of chains of amino acids, which are primary structures, right? And as far, and there's also the, the proteins, which kind of are, are basically a fiber called all these, call it like the hair fibers, they're different from globular proteins, which are like enzymes and other structural proteins that mostly lack. We're going, to we're going to review this, but I need you to already have it populated before I review it so that I can go through it quickly, all right? So today I want to focus on something else instead, this last column over here. Let's talk about the things that the carbs, what elements show up in carbs? Carbon. Oh, actually, what element shows up in all of them? Carbon. 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 Is that the only one that shows up in all of them? Hydrogen. Hydrogen. Hydrogen is in all of them. Is that the only one that shows up in all of them? Oxygen is in all of them, all right? So inside everybody is the Chinese. Person, right? Cho. <laughs> right? But <laughs> carbs. Carbs, that's it. That's all they have. The, but they tend to be in the monomer. This is very important. The monomer tends to be in a one to one ratio. The monomer of the carbs. That's interesting about it. Right? The carbs monomers will have twice as many hydrogens as, uh, as carbons. Just the monomers. The thing is that when you apply the putting molecules together, you take out a water molecule to do that, and then it, you, you lose that ratio. But on the lipids, it's also true, but they don't have that one-to-one -one ratio on the monomers. And in fact, the, the lipids have a lot of repeating units of, of this, which are, are hydrocarbons, right? So the hydrocarbons, in, in, in the, on the other hand, carbs have a lot of repeating units of hydroxide groups. This makes carbons very soluble, and this makes them insoluble, which of course means these like water and these do not like water, right? So the OH groups is like an alcohol functional group. It, it makes, the, uh, makes the sugars very soluble, right? Meanwhile, the CH group uh, <coughs> makes them insoluble, right? Now, what's in nucleic acids? That's only in nucleic acids. Not of the other ones. Phosphorus. Phosphorus. Very good. Give Kevin a thing. All right? Phosphorus. Shock. What, what do they all also have? Nitrogen. Nitrogen. Very good. So actually it's chunk. Chunk. Okay? Now, what's in proteins? Does it have nitrogen? Yes, it does. An amino group, right? With the nitrogen. And also some of the... Some of the side, uh, side chains also have amino in it, right? But this, this shows up in a carboxyl group. There's a center carbon on the amino acid. There's a carboxyl group, then there's an amino group, and there's a hydrogen hat. So this will be there regardless of the side chains. This next one, though, is only there because of the side chains. <laughs> Who else is in protein? There's one thing else in protein. Not phosphorus. Never. That is already there. Sulfur. Who said sulfur? Have courage. All right? Chons. Now, phosphorus also shows up in a special type of lipid. So there's phospholipids which have phosphorus. So now, a plant needs all of these elements to survive. Where do they get the carbon from? From the air. Very good. Now notice that the majority of, of, of life is made of water and carbon. Look at it. Water, HO2, and carbon. Are you with me? 
Everybody clear on that? H2O, loss of hydrogen, some water, and lots of carbon, right? So where does the water the plants get come from? From the ground, from the ground. yes. So we're going to talk a lot about, the, about how 99% of the water just evaporates, right? Why? Because the plants actually cool down that way, okay? They need to keep the water evaporated to keep the water flowing. And you need to keep the water flowing to keep the nutrients coming. So it's actually more important to keep the loose water than conserve it. Because to lo losing water is what preserves the flow, and the flow is what brings the nutrients. It's kind of like their vascular system. They need that. Are you with me what I'm trying to say? They also need the water flow to maintain turgidity. So if the plants stop getting water, they just, <laughs> are you with me? So they need a constant water flow. So the plants are always in a status of, of water loss. They always want to suck up more water. They like to be, um, in cell membrane terms, they like to be what? When you have sucking up a lot of water. They be wet. No, yes, <laughs> like that. They like to be wet. Here are the two, three layers for that. All right? But they, what does it mean when you, your cells are in a status of constantly trying to suck up water? Hypotonic? Hypotonic, yes. They like, very good, give it to them in three layers. All right? They like to be in a state of sucking up water. Now, so they get carbon from the air, though. Now, if you look at water and, and uh, oxygen, all right? The hydrogen barely counts for mass. It's like two, the, the, pro, the number of uh, atomic, the atomic mass is like maybe one, maybe two, right? Hydrogen, oxygen has 16, so it's a fairly, you know, uh, big molecule. But there's less oxygen than there's carbon, always. Oxygen is a minority. So carbon is what really the biomass is made of. Are you with me? And honestly, the oxygen that's in things, this oxygen is not really from water. It's from the carbon dioxide oxygen. Are you with me what I'm trying to say? So where does the biomass that is in you come from? What are you made of? Oh, where does the matter that you are made of come from, ultimately? Carbon dioxide. Yeah, so it comes from air. So we're all made of thin air. <laughs> right? So you are basically the compressed air. Uh, Creature. Of course, that's not what it is. It's now a solid, right? It's, that's why carbon fixation is so awesome. So it's photosynthesis because that, that that's so important for this process. Mm -hmm. It's part of the carbon cycle, right? It grabs the thing to, from the atmosphere. Now, how does carbon return to the atmosphere? How does carbon return to the atmosphere? Cell respiration, which is burning carbon dioxide, right? So the, the burning the the biomolecules to make carbon dioxide out of them, right? So this is actually interesting that the carbon dioxide becomes sugar, becomes proteins, becomes, together with the water, right? Just the H from the water, though. What happens to the oxygen of the water part in photosynthesis? It goes to the air, right? So out of the water that comes from the ground, 99% just passes through the plant because they get to keep the water moving. And then a small percentage of the water, just the hydrogen of the 1% that actually engages in photosynthesis, just the little hydrogens go to the sugars, the proteins, the amino acids, everything else. The oxygen goes to the air. So it means plants are made of thin air, right? Is that interesting, right? But uh, the oxygen actually goes to the air. It's just the hydrogens that goes into the mix there. But we're basically made of carbon dioxide, right? So the carbon dioxide, so that's a misconception people have. Do plants get carbon dioxide transformed into oxygen? No, where does the oxygen come from? From what? I just said, from the water. So plants break water down to oxygen and get carbon dioxide and turn it into macromolecules. Are you with me? So it's a misconception that plants take carbon dioxide in and put oxygen out. Technically, that's what they do. But, te but more specifically, it's not what they actually do. It's like carbon dioxide goes to macromolecules, water goes to oxygen. Are you with me? So that's actually what's happening because we'll talk more about that later in the year. But anyways, that's the carbon cycle. How else can water return uh, oxygen? Return to, what about uh, if you die? You, a lot of the things, the biomass that you have, doesn't return to the air because of, whew, it's still still on me. And then it got eaten. It goes to someone else. And it got eaten. It goes to someone else. But ultimately, all of the biomass. What happens to it? If it doesn't go to the air, what happens to it? It goes to the soil. How? Decomposition. Now, during decomposition, some of the biomatter the right, goes to the soil and becomes carbonate, some of it becomes fossilized, some of it becomes rock, 
carbon in water, right? But the majority of the carbon dioxide that was in you, the carbon and the oxygen, which is the majority of the stuff, goes back where? To the air, through also for, uh, so that's, um, decomposition. So both processes are important. It's not just cell respiration. Because a lot of the carbon on you stays on you for a long time. In fact, the carbon that's on you could be very old in the, in the chain of life. All right? Because you ate, uh, you well, especially if you're carnivore, right? Because let's say you ate a fish. Well, that fish may have been 15 years old by the time you caught it. Who knows? And then the carbon that you that you ate from him could have come from another fish that was 15 years old, right? So you could have carbon on you that's been in the food chain for hundreds of years since the since the algae actually captured it. Are you with me? which is something to think about with toxins, right? When the toxin goes in the water, the same way the carbon stays in the food chain for years, toxins stay in the food chain for many years. So the gulf is safe to eat five years after the oil spill. That makes no sense, all right? Yes? Is that biomagnification? Well, magnification is when, uh, it's something else we'll talk more about later in the year, all right? I don't want to go there now, all right? But it's the idea that, that um, I'll go there now. Right? It's the idea that you eat, uh, the, the algae collects, it, as, it's got absorbing water, it absorbs the, the toxin, but then other things will eat that. But since they only get 10% of the energy, they have to eat more biomass, right? So there will be 10 algae maybe, or 100 algae, right? And then each of the algae they eat has a toxin in it. So now that organism has 100 times the toxin. And then this next link, because only 10% of the energy transfers because of the heat loss and stuff like that, right? You will also have to eat a lot more, so we have to eat a hundred or a thousand of the, that fish. And then throughout the food chain, that causes the higher levels to have a bigger uh, bigger number of uh, toxins in them uh, than the bottom. And decomposers are the worst because they eat from every layer, right? So that's why things like lobster and, and shrimp are the dirtiest things in the ocean, right? They live in the bottom decomposition, they eat all everybody that has all the toxins. Not only that, also, there's also bioaccumulation, which is the idea that throughout your life, there are certain things that you don't process. You don't have kidneys for it. Fish don't even have kidneys. So they, they have nephrons. It, it, it's all, I guess they have a, like an early kidney kind of thing. But uh, it's not really the kidney that we have, which is like complicated nephronic systems. So it's like really, really simple. They're not going to get rid of those toxins, a lot of them. And the livers are also not very developed to metabolize some of these stuff. So we'll just stick on them. But even you, even if you can solve all the problems that there is, free radicals, telomeres, genetics, everything that's killing us, right? We will ultimately die because we become a waste dump throughout our life. Are you with me? Because everything we eat has toxins in it. And eventually, that toxin just stays on you because your body doesn't have a mechanism to get rid of it. So you literally, over time, you literally become toxic, right? So that's interesting. Yes. So that's why it's uh, important to, to eat well. Yes? This is how Uh-huh. No, you do it on Google, so I can see that you're typing it, okay. right? Yeah. All right, and never show your work to someone else. Nobody ever sees your work, it's just advice. You know that bad pep talk I had earlier today? One of these days, I'm gonna have a, a month of pep talk when I catch someone cheating. It happens every year. You do not wanna see the fallout of that, all right? Maybe you wanna see it, someone else being involved in it. <laughs> but, uh -huh. So is it now? Hold on. So hold on. I have 20 minutes. I have to talk for a little while now. Okay. So then, nitrogen. We're talking about carbon cycle. Let's talk about the nitrogen cycle. Does the nitrogen have to go through that too? So the plant. Where does the nitrogen come from then? The nitrogen is in you. The nitrogen that shows up in these molecules. Where is it? Where does it come from? From plants. Yes. But where do plants get it from? From the ground. In the what form? So it was carbon dioxide for carbon. How do plants get nitrogen? Bacteria, bacteria do a part of that composers, right? They, they convert things like urea, things like proteins, amino acids, anything that has nitrogen in it. The decomposers convert that ultimately to ammonia, which then all the decomposers convert to nitrates and nitrites, which are well, nitrites and then nitrates, which are plants actually use. This is a nitrogen cycle. Review it if you don't understand it. There's a little animation about it, short one minute animation about it on the views in my tutorials folder. Yeah. There always is, right? For uh, ecology, general ecology, right? So if you go to general ecology folder, there's a video animation about that, right? So then, there's a little bit of ecology here. 
finally. But anyways, the gen that was population ecology and evolution theory. But anyways, the, the general ecology concept here is that that nitrogen is cycling on the soil. By the way, there's also bacteria that, that fix it directly from the air. They do what they, those are more ancient even than the photosynthetic bacteria. They are the ones that capture nitrogen from the atmosphere, right? And they convert that nitrogen to, to ammonia, which then can convert to nitrates and nitrites, which is what the plants actually absorb, right? So the plants need these things. And a lot of the fertilizers that people use have a lot of nitrates and nitrites. That's why you can make bombs out of that. That's why you can make nitroglycerin out of that. You know what I'm saying? Fertilizer. All right. And then the plants put that in amino acids, and they put, they put that in nucleic acids, which then get, uh, when we eat them, we eat that from them. Now, we are actually capable of building our own amino acids. We have, we don't need the amino acids from the plant, but there are some amino acids that we don't make, so we need it from the plants. But there are metabolic processes that we have to convert one amino acid to another type of amino acid and stuff like that. So we are also builders of amino acids, but we usually get the R nitrogen from amino acids and nucleic acids from the plants. You know what I'm saying? We're not capable of converting nitrates and nitrites to amino acids. So our plants, photosynthetic organisms only. And they're more important than that. What are they doing? They are also givers of what? Nitrogen. They are the way the nitrogen comes in. Is that clear for everybody? So stop taking your producers as makers of sugar. They're makers of the molecules of life. Right? So, um, and by the way, photosynthesis does not make sugar. Photosynthesis actually makes G3P, which is a building block that can be used to make any of these things. All right? It's basically a show building block. And as you can see, that building block shows up in all of them. All right? Are you with me? So plants don't make sugar. They make G3P, which can be used to make any of the molecules. Right? Now, they have a metabolic pathway to put nitrogen in there and make amino acids out of it. And we, we have a pathways to transform their amino acids into our own, uh, so we can make some of the amino acids without eating it. But those 20 essential amino acids, if you don't have a diet that has them, you can make some of them. But other ones, you don't. And there are people that have disorders where they can metabolize, metabolize some of them, and it causes problems. About, what about um, phosphorus? This is not on your objectives, but let's talk about phosphorus. Phosphorus is only going to show up in nucleic acids and in the cell membranes. So it's going to show up everywhere. Right? Cell membranes. Every cell membrane has it. Now, and also, in a special nucleic acid, called ATP, GTP, these are our CTP, and uh, what is CTG? TTP, which are the building blocks of nucleic acids. They're called nucleotide triphosphates. But they also double as energy molecules. Now, that's interesting. It has a significance for the early characteristics of life. The same molecule that carries genetic information also is a molecule that air carries energy. Why? Because that means you can, it's easier to make a copy because the actual letter has energy in itself. Would you spend energy writing letters? Do you? Do you spend energy when you write things down? Yeah. Right. So, but imagine if the pen or the ink that you're writing with was the energy you needed to write with. That's what life did. That's super smart. Are you with me what I'm saying? That was easy. Yes? Are you saying that like, uh, <laughs> in certain situations we can break down the like, gases for energy? Like, not in certain situations. All the time. All the time. Except it would be not be that way though. Because what you're suggesting is that they have ATP in it. No. But by, by the time you put in a nucleic acid, it's not ATP anymore. It's actually uh, AMP, which is just one. It's just uh, adenosine, one phosphate, and one sugar. Right? But ATP has three phosphates. But during the process of building DNA, they actually take out the last two phosphates and they, they use that energy to actually build a molecule. But the interesting thing is then that this must have been some, this is a conserved core process, and with me and its structure, because early in the history of life, it was advantageous to use a molecule to write the code which had the energy. Are you with me? Because that way you would already have a self-replicating nature uh, uh, feature to it. Does that make sense? To, right. All right. But anyways. Phosphorus is commonly a limiting factor because the carbon is in the air, the nitrogen goes to the air, right? By the way, uh, we, the nitrogen that we go, that we die, goes back to the ground as ammonia. But sometimes, um, when things burn, nitrogen and sulfur go to the air and it mix up with the water and become acid rain, right? And that happens from volcanoes, because volcanoes have ammonia gas in them, but it also happens because of more things that we do, right? But then it, ra it rains down as nitric acid or sulfuric acid, and then bacteria do the same thing with it and eventually convert it to the other forms.
All right, yes. What? Absolutely. It takes forever for that. So when you, when you put yourself in a casket, you're, you're slowing down your return to the, to the cycle of life. But isn't that the whole point? You want to preserve you somehow in that, in that casket? It's the most stupid thing I've ever heard. It's such, it's one more reason why religious people are stupid in my case. They're, we are running out of room. I, I, no, sorry, not in general. But I think that's so stupid. I'm sorry. I don't know if I offend people. But like, it's such, this is my opinion. It's not a fact. Okay? But it's just like, I walk, I drive by a cemetery and I'm like, what a tremendous waste of space. Now you know why the cemetery is for? It's not for the dead. It's for the living. It's for the living to go there and basically remember and connect and, and, and honor the dead. I see some people. When I, I walked to the, out the cemetery in Washington D.C. and monuments, we have case of the memorial was there. It's very right there. I think there's something to say about that. It's like honoring your ancestors, the people who have died for you. Right? They have a place for them. Right? Do we need a place for that, though? Like, isn't it, can we honor them more with our actions? With the way we live? Right? But does Anyways, the action deteriorate? I, don't, I just think it's an empty act to go so by it, this thing, and then just put a flower there. So it's, 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 it's only for yourself that you're doing it. You're not really honoring them. But when, when you, your, uh, your cousin died in the war, and then you show patriotism in honor of his memory, that is a more meaningful act than going to his grave and giving, giving flowers in my kids. All right? That, that's just my opinion. But anyways. Do you want to be creative? Yeah. Um, or an air burial. What? Air burial is when they put you and the birds just cut, pick up the pieces. Oh my God. Oh my God. All right? So, you know? So, um, so, the problem is that there's 8 billion people. If we buy, start burning everybody that dies, and air burying everybody that dies, it gets really nasty and dirty. Are you with me? But honestly, we should just throw people in the landfills. All right? You know what I'm saying? It returns to the garbage where decomposition is taking place. That's what most people are anyway, a bunch of garbage. Anyways, all right, that's messed up. I'm just kidding, I'm kidding. All right, hey, we actually have a lot of power still. Shh, this is gonna spill over. Now, uh, okay, I just want to add about phosphorus. Now, since phosphorus ne doesn't have an atmospheric form, if I'm sitting here in a lake, right, I'm sitting in a lake, and I need some phosphorus to make some protein out of it, not sorry, yeah, DNA out of it, but I don't have on the water any phosphorus, how do I get some? Is that a bacteria that fixates it from the air? No. So I have to sit here and wait for rainwater to bring me some through erosion. Are you with me? And so phosphorus is what we call a limiting factor uh, a lot in ecosystems. By the way, how can you tell from an ecosystem growth, for any type of growth graph, that there's a limiting factor? It will look like this. You're going to have a line, right, that's growing, 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 and then it, the famous carrying capacity thing, right? But what does that mean? That means there is some sort of limiting factor. What happens if I add phosphorus from here, therefore? It will grow again, because it will stop limiting. Are you with me? So I, if I had this, and I add an unlimited amount of phosphorus, right? But then it flats out again, what does that mean? Is phosphorus limiting it now? No. Something else is limiting it now. So it got to a point that we had enough phosphorus, but now there's something else that's, that's limiting. Are you with me? Graphs like that symbolize limitation. Something is preventing the population from growing further. And phosphorus is a good example of something that usually does that. So that's why we usually use fertilizers. All right, moving on. I'm actually going to, skip to talk about B, probably next class if I have time for it. But first, let's talk about water. All right, yes? Okay, I don't want to talk about the assignment right now. I have better things to do. I know you're freaking out about the assignment. We'll talk about that later. Okay. I'll email you your instructions. All right? You freak out too much about your grade and forget to learn. Seriously. Are you with me? Stop worrying so much. I don't actually worry, oh, I did a format wrong, but if all the learning was there, I'll probably still give you an A. Are you with me, I'm trying to say? So you guys have so much emotional tension about doing things right. But the most important thing to do right, you're not doing right, which is what? To study. Are you with me, I'm trying to say? Save that tension to the right place. 
all right? Care more about learning than your grade, and all of a sudden, you're going to see your grade going skyrocket, all right? So when I was in college, I used to get good grades, yes. And not a perfect example, but in our high school, excellent grades. But you know why I asked in grades? It's not because I was, a, I, I was always using the system. I didn't. I could use the system, but I never was. I was like, I would walk into a test, and I'd be like, "Defeat me." That was my attitude. Let's see if you, what you got. Are you with me? That was my attitude. My attitude was like, I learned so much, I could teach this damn class. So let me see if you can, if you can give me a test that will, that will show you that that I haven't. You know what I'm saying? That's the attitude. That it wasn't about doing the right right the test. It was about me learning it. And you know why I wanted to learn it? Because I loved science, I loved history, I was interested in becoming a better person. And that ultimately is what you need to cultivate. And when you worry too much about ways, you lose that. Because it stops being about you and about stops being about the reward. Are you with me? I know you stress out you want to do things right. Ask me later. All right. So living systems depend on properties of water. Let's talk about this. So there's another chart that you can think about doing, but this one, maybe we can do it together with it. And there is an FRQ on this, for sure. Actually, if you haven't noticed yet, all the FRQs are on things we cover in class, right? So, so it's like the test is on the book stuff, and the FRQs are on me. Are you with me? So, if you pay attention to me, you do all the FRQs. Do pay attention to the book, you do all the tests, all right? But anyways, water properties. So, what I want is for you to list the, pro the property of water, and then give me a... a an example of how it helps life. But before we talk about problems of water, let's quickly talk about water. What's water made of? All right, so it has an oxygen, right, and two hydrogens. Now the cool thing about oxygen is that it's like a bitch, okay? It's a hogger, it wants electrons. There's only one thing in the world that wants more electrons than hydrogen, and that's fluorine. All right? Now, who's scared of being eaten by a tiger? Why would you be scared of that? Have you ever seen a tiger in your life? A loose? I'm not scared of being eaten by a tiger. Do you worry day and night, oh my God, was a tiger? <laughs> no, why don't you worry about tigers? Is that a concern you have? And you walk around the street, oh my God, a tiger. <laughs> no, why not? Because tigers are rare. They're rare where we are, aren't they? They're scary, but they're Brand, right? So I don't have to worry about being eaten by one. Now, oxygen is not the most <coughs> electronegative thing out there. Fluorine is. Fluorine is an electron hogger. If fluorine walks by and you have an electron, you rip it from you and you notice it. <laughs> but the thing is, because fluorine is rare, oxygen is the electronegative queen. She's always screwing things up. That's why in the origin of life, you couldn't have it around, because it would screw up things by thinking, trying to do oxidation. Uh, that's why it's called oxidation, because oxygen is always ripping electrons out. So oxidation is the act, act of, of losing an electron, right? To whom? Most likely oxygen. Are you with me? That's why it's called oxygen. That's why iron left in the air becomes rust. And that's why you left in the air gets exposed to a bunch of free radicals, right? Because oxygen is slowly killing you. You're breathing the thing that's killing you every day. And so the thing about it, oxygen is an electronegative block. So in this scenario here, the puny little hydrogens have no chance. Absolutely no chance. They, their electrons is a covalent bond by S. It belongs to the oxygen. Remember that. This was what polarity is all about. This molecule is polar because the electrons tend to hang out with oxygen, making this side negative compared to the other side. Everybody clear on that? It is effectively like that. So it becomes a little magnet on the positive and negative side. So that means one oxygen molecule and another oxygen molecule are attracted to each other because this oxygen molecule and another oxygen molecule, if you notice, they, this is a negative end and that's a positive end. And since this is a positive end as well, there's a little bit of attraction between them. Are you with me? That's called a van der Waal force, a, a force between two adjacent molecules. Right? Now, the interesting thing about this particular van der Waal force, it's between a highly electronegative atom and a puny little other atom, and hydrogen, called hydrogen. Right? even though it's the most common element of the, in the universe, right? Now, any time you have fluorine, oxygen, so we're talking about the corner up there, because that corner is so close to being noble, they're like the aristocracy, they're almost the aristocracy, you know? That's like the people in the, in the luministic age, 
that the, the, the led the, the French Revolution, they were so rich and almost super influential. All they needed is to become kings. So they cut the king's heads, right? So they really wanted that. So all they want is to be a noble guest. And all they need is one or two more electrons. We're talking about oxygen. We're talking about fluorine. We're talking about chlorine, all right? These guys are going to be my electronegative guys. And nitrogen sometimes, too. Nitrogen sometimes, too. Right? Especially, actually, the order is fawn CL. So this is from most of the more on that than negative. So if you have fluorine and hydrogen, so as a molecule that has fluorine, this is fluorine, hold on, also it's there. And I'm a, I'm a hydrogen. And I'm just walking by here, that molecule with the fluorine there, it will try to steal my electron. Right? Now you should think about this this water, this oxygen already has eight electrons because it's sharing the two electrons, sharing my S with the hydrogens. But another hydrogen comes by and says, oh, you have an electron, right? So it actually tries to get another one, even though, because it is kind of hogging these two, but it's not, it's not his or hers, right? So it says, I still want more. So that's kind of like that. So every time there's a molecule with a fluorine hanging out and a hydrogen that walks by, it will try to do that. Anytime there's a molecule with a chlorine hanging out, now, so water is an example of that because it's a molecule with, with a, one of these hanging out and hydrogen is nearby, right? This is called hydrogen bonding. And it's actually important in a lot of places in life, not just this. Another molecule that does this is DNA. Another molecule that does this is protein. But actually, this is not a water thing. It's a, in general, any time a molecule has an oxygen hanging out next to a hydrogen, it doesn't even have to be oxygen, any of these, but it will, it will, it will have the taste to form these hydrogen bonds. Now, hydrogen bonds are weak, very weak, compared to something like an ionic bond or a covalent bond, but they are stronger than most van der Waal forces, which means in, as far as intermolecular forces are concerned, they're a little stronger. Now, in addition to this ability to hydrogen bond, water is also polar, and that means it acts like a magnet. So when you put these two things together, you have a magnetic hydrogen bonding molecule. So if in this wall there are hydrogens, and there are hydrogens everywhere in the universe, water will stick to it. Because of the oxygen part of the water, We'll try to attach it to it. Are you with me? And it, so that's the thing. Water sticks to everything because most most of the things have hydrogen in it. Now, in the molecules of life, which one of them has hydrogen in it? All of them. So water sticks to them. Are you with me? Water is attracted to things with hydrogen in it. It forms hydrogen bonds with those things. Right? Anything that's charged, polar, water likes it. Anything that is, that is uh, water tends to stick to things that have charge or to things that have hydrogen. Right? Because water is something that's charged, kind of, polar, and has hydrogen, it takes to stick to itself. And from those things, from that comes the properties of water, right? So you make to make sure where the properties come from, but you have to talk about where they actually do. So let's start with cohesion, right? So you got to know what the property is, and an example of how it helps life. So cohesion is what? Water, to sticking to water. Now, I'm gonna, I have a little time, so I'm not going to write. So you can get it from the video later. But I'm going to do like the <laughs> version of this, and then you can complete this later because you're going to need it for an FRQ. Now, cohesion. That's how clouds form. Water sticking to itself. Without it, would there be no clouds? Without no clouds, air would, the, the light would blast us a lot more, and the earth would be a lot warmer. It's because of cohesion that we have lakes and rivers. And imagine the life without that, right? It's because of cohesion that the top layer of the water has something called surface tension. It's because of surface tension that organisms can lay eggs on the water and the, uh, the eggs sprout there already on the top of the water and, and, and where, where it's moist and they don't, they don't have to go find water. The eggs don't need to be protected by shells because they're already in the water and, and, and protected by the surrounding, right? Lots of organisms do that. It's because of cohesion and surface tension that, that the, the water is capable of sticking to itself and climb up. The, the, the inside of the of the plants because that's called capillary action, right? Capillary action actually co combines with adhesion. I'll talk about that in a second. But part of it is cohesion because think of it as a water train that's inside there, and each water is holding onto the other as the water is climbing up. Without cohesion, it wouldn't be possible. It's because of cohesion and surface tension that the cell membranes hold together. Because on one side of the cell membrane, there's that there's that that phospholipid, right? But the head loves water, and it's right. And the heads are touching water. 
And so, but it's like this. You have the two phospholipid heads, and then the tails are in between, they hate water, right? Which, by the way, is something else we're going to talk about in a second. But this side here is touching water, but here's the thing about it. This is water, therefore the surface tension here. That surface tension kind of pushes the membrane in from both ends, and that's actually holds the integrity of the membrane. If it wasn't for surface tension, there'd be no water. In fact, it is that property which made life start possible because the coarser formation, the bubbling, it help, it's all about that property. In fact, the surface tension is even more important than that. Think about you. How does your skin hold together? That's water. Surface tension. Think about a jellyfish. Doesn't have no bones, no shells, no nothing. Why is it together? Proteins and water. Right? So it's interesting. That's cohesion. Adhesion. That's because water is polar. It sticks to anything that's polar or charged. And because it has hydrogen bonds, it will stick to anything that has hydrogen hanging out. Because of that, it sticks to what it thinks. Because it sticks to what it thinks, water will stick to the leaves, to the bottom of the leaves, and the leaves will lose less water because of it. Right? Are you with me, I'm saying? I'm just kidding. I'm with you. I'm with you with what you're saying. Okay? Because... You say that a lot. Huh? Yeah. Because... Are you with me? Yes, I'm saying a lot. I'm with because you. Because water adheres to things, right? Capillary action, right? To the side of the things. Um, anybody think of another example of a water adhesion and being important? Yes? Capillary action. Are you saying? Good morning. Uh, there's another one. Oh, yes. Adhesion is why it makes water so good at dissolving things. Because... Water will try to adhere to things, and that's what makes it dissolve it. When salt dissolves, it's basically water tries to adhere to the salt and ends up surrounding the salt particles, and you can't even see them because they're really surrounded by water. We'll talk more about that later. Huh? Like salt, also to do with that, but there's something else. We'll talk about that in a second. All right? High specific heat. Another property important that's important. All right. So at these, we talk about some of them which are important. I don't want to high specific heat. It takes water is a molecule that has a high specific. That means it takes a lot of energy to heat it up. That's because it, the first, before you can actually make the molecules move faster, which is being warmer, heat or temperature is directly related to the motion of the molecules. But for them to move, they can be attached. And then those hydrogen bonds may be broken first. So the first energy goes to bringing the bonds before it actually goes to warm up the molecules. Are you with me? Which means it takes a lot to heat water up. That's very helpful for life. Why? Because we're above. It keeps us cool. But more than that, Lakes, rivers, oceans don't heat up as fast. And once they heat up, they keep the heat. They don't lose it either, which means the Gulf current can heat up the, the northern hemisphere, right? If it wasn't because of that property of keeping the heat once you take it and it being hard to heat up, we wouldn't have the currents. The, the, the rain and air currents full of water also heat up the globe. When water evaporates, it keeps the heat with it and it warms up at night. It would be like mercury at night, very cold. The high specific heat of water keeps us alive. The rainforest, hot, humid. Why? Because of water. Right? It's not because of the sunlight. It does get a lot of sunlight, but it's the water that gives you that steamy, humid feeling. Are you with me? You should know better than anybody else who live in Florida, right? So, universal solid. We talked about that water because of its adhesion. It support, it's the medium that supports all the chemical reactions of life. All right? Here's the other thing about that. When it doesn't dissolve, what does it do to it? It pushes it away, which is what makes the bubbles that form that life start. If it wasn't for that property, the bubbles where that have formed, we wouldn't be here. All right? Heat of vaporization. It takes a lot of energy to make water evaporate. Again, why? Because you must first destroy the bonds. Now, here's what's interesting about it. Once the bonds are broken, the hottest molecules are the ones that leave first. Are you with me? So the ones that have heat go to gas. Are you with me? You don't need to boil water for the water to evaporate. Correct? You just sit it there, it will what? Why? Because each of those molecules in that glass, there are some which are have, have a lot of energy. What happens to them? And, and if they don't have energy, they can get it from a, some a source of light like this. Are you with me? If you put it in a the fridge, they're, lo they're losing energy, so they're not going to evaporate. But if you put it in any place that's warmer than that place, they can gain energy, right? And then therefore, evaporate. Are you with me? So the water can evaporate. Without it, because each molecule has an X amount of energy, and each molecule can just jump to gas state. But it's always the hottest ones that evaporate first. This is huge for life. Because if you are really hot, as water evaporates, it's taking what with it? The heat, because the hottest ones leave first. So, did you ever watch a puddle disappear? 
Right? You're just going to do some Buddhist meditation, man. Watch your problems with your ones, okay? You, if you're stressed out, you have a problem, throw some more on the ground and just watch it and think about life, right? When you're doing that, I can guarantee you the area of where the point was at becomes colder because the water is leaving you. So when the air blasts the ocean and the ocean starts evaporating, that actually helps the ocean stay cool. That's how plants cool off. That's how you cool off. It's called evaporative cooling. And that's how air conditionings work. Air conditioning systems work based on two principles, air compression and evaporative cooling. So actually that helps us live in Florida, right? Heat of fusion. Water gives up a lot of heat when it, when it forms, becomes a solid, right? Because it takes a lot of heat, it keeps a lot of heat. So to, be, to make a water solidified, you need to give up a lot of heat, which means when ice forms, it actually warms up the air around it. You know what I'm trying to say? Which is interesting, right? So, and also water, water is expands when it solidifies. It's a, such a weird thing. Things becoming solid means becoming denser, unless it's water. If it's water, it expands. That's crucial for life, because if it didn't do that, when the ice formed, what would happen to it? It would sink, and if you're underneath it, what would happen to you? You'd be, but more than that, because the ice flows, it acts like an insulator. Now, underneath the ice, it's zero degrees. Never more. Always not or under. Never worse than zero. It's always zero or above. Are you with me? Hold on a second. What does that mean? If I have to choose between living in a pole, cold region, or underneath, zero, negative 20, zero. That's why in polar regions, life is aquatic. Protected by the ice because life is expands. All of these amazing properties make water a crucial element of life, a, a, a molecule of life, all right? So next class, we'll talk about surface water volume ratio and about the next CK study. There may be an effort you about the amazing water next time. All right? Let me show you really quick. Go. This is really cool. And uh, if I...